Welcome back to Control System Lectures. In this video, we're going to talk about the complementary filter. It's such a dead simple filter, which is a good reason to learn it, but it's also practical because it produces nice results when blending measurements from two different sensors. To understand how a complementary filter works and the situations where it's useful, we should set up a problem. Let's imagine we have a drone and we're trying to estimate the roll angle using its onboard inertial measurement unit, or IMU. The IMU has both a gyro that senses angular rate and an accelerometer that senses linear acceleration. So the question is, how can we measure the roll angle with the IMU? Now, neither of these sensors can measure the roll angle directly. However, we can use either of them to estimate the roll angle. Let's look at how we would do that using just the gyro measurements. If we assume that the roll angle is zero degrees when the drone is sitting on the ground, then after it takes off, we can use the measured roll rates to calculate how the roll angle changes over time. That is, we can determine how far the drone has rotated in one time step and then add that value to the current estimate of roll angle. For example, if we read the gyro 10 times a second and at the first time step the roll rate measures three degrees per second, then after that time step, or 0.1 seconds later, we can estimate that the drone has rotated 0.3 degrees. We can then add that delta angle to the current roll estimate. Then at the next time step, we do it again, and then again, and again. Basically, we are integrating the angular rate to get angles. That's pretty straightforward, right? Well, this type of approach is called dead reckoning, and it's very good for keeping track of motion over short periods of time. How short? Well, it depends on the noise and error characteristics of the gyro. When we integrate the rate measurements, any uncorrected bias in the gyro, or even just random high frequency noise, gets summed as well. And with these cumulative errors, eventually there's going to be a large difference between the true roll angle and the angle we estimate. Dead reckoning is a relative measurement, and there's no absolute measurement that will correct the roll over time. Now, let's look at how to estimate roll angle using the accelerometer. Gravity is always pointing down, and near the surface of the Earth it causes an acceleration of 1g. Let's imagine that the drone is sitting stationary on the ground, and since there's no other accelerations acting on the drone, the accelerometer will only be measuring the acceleration due to gravity. Now, the drone knows which direction is down, and knowing down relative to the drone reference frame, it can determine the roll angle. A simple way to do this is to just take the arc tangent of the acceleration in the y and z direction to get angle. This measurement, however, isn't very precise in the short term because the accelerometer is also noisy. But more importantly than that, it measures all accelerations. Any time the drone accelerates in any direction, the measurement is no longer just from gravity. Now, we could ignore accelerations that are outside of some boundary, but even really small accelerations can throw off the estimation of the down direction, and then therefore the roll angle. Even rolling the drone will induce a linear acceleration if the IMU isn't located precisely at the center of rotation. For these reasons, it's hard to rely solely on the accelerometer for short duration, very quick roll measurements. But the accelerometer is very stable long term, because the gravity vector doesn't change over time. The measurement of the gravity vector isn't wandering off like the rate-based roll angle did. We may not want to trust it much at any given moment, but at least we have an absolute understanding of which way down is over really long timescales. So we have two different ways of determining the roll angle. Integrating the gyro, which is more accurate over the short term, and measuring the acceleration, which is more accurate over the long term. To let you visualize these two methods, I created a simple JavaScript program that uses a noisy accelerometer and a noisy gyro to show you the direction the drone thinks is down with either method. Notice how the acceleration method is bouncing around more than the gyro. Both sensors have the same amount of noise, but the gyro is integrated, which attenuates high frequencies and makes it less jittery than the acceleration method. So that smoothness makes it better over the short term, like we talked about but the gyro is slowly wandering around, at times further than the accelerometer direction. With these two estimates of roll angle from two different sensors, we can now combine them using a complementary filter. Let me reset the values from the gyro and accelerometer sensors and add a third drone that uses a complementary filter to estimate roll angle. This filter needs to run for a little while for you to see the benefits, so I'm just going to minimize this and go back to explaining what the complementary filter is doing while it runs in the background. 
Complementary in this sense means that we combine the two measurements in a way that complete each other. Or in other words, we take some part of one measurement and add it to the complementary part of the other so that the sum of the two parts is still one whole measurement. In our case, we'd want to keep the short-term benefits of the gyro and add them to the long-term benefits of the accelerometer. Making these two parts complementary is easier than you might think. If we pass the Excel measurement through a low-pass filter, G of S, then the filter that we pass the gyro through is the high-pass filter, 1 minus G of S. Since adding these two filters together equals 1, then they're complementary of each other. This is the basic complementary filter. And G of S can be any filter you want, like a notch filter or something. And 1 minus G of S will be its complement. However, more often than not, they are just the standard low-pass and high-pass filter. Now, in our case with a rate sensor and accelerometer, this block diagram isn't actually the way we would implement this filter because it would result in a lot of extra steps, like integrating and filtering multiple signals that really just cancel out if we reduce this block diagram. I'll show you what I mean with an example. We'll use a first order low pass filter for the acceleration, one over tau s plus one. This makes the high pass filter tau s over tau s plus one. And since the integral is one over s, we can cancel out those s's and then factor the low pass filter to after the summing junction. And look at this, we're no longer converting the rate measurements into angles at all. We're just scaling it and then adding it to the acceleration angle and low pass filtering the result. To tune this filter, we simply need to pick the time constant tau for the low pass filter. A lower tau raises the cutoff frequency and lets more Excel frequencies in and fewer gyro frequencies and a higher tau does the opposite. Now, picking the ideal cutoff frequency depends on the noise characteristics of the two sensors and can be adjusted during simulation or tests. All right, now the continuous domain is a perfectly fine way to implement a complementary filter, but since most control algorithms run on digital computers, let's talk about a simple and intuitive way to implement a discrete filter that we can code in software. Let's start with the gyro measurement, which we're reading every time step. We multiply this measurement by the length of time for one time step to get the angle traveled during that period. Now we can add this angle to the existing estimated roll angle. I'm going to explain where we get this in just a second. At this point we have an updated roll estimate for the current time step from just the gyro. But we also have another roll estimate from the accelerometer that we're also reading every time step. We can combine these two angles by taking a fixed fraction of one and the complementary fraction of the other. So for example, we may take 98% of the gyro measurement and add that to 2% of the Excel measurement so that ever so slightly we're nudging the gyro angle in the acceleration direction. This new angle is the estimated roll angle that we feed back at the next time step. By believing the gyro more, we're allowing the short term speed and agility to make it through but we're nudging it back towards the absolute down direction over time to keep the angle from wandering off. This is how we're getting the long-term stability of the accelerometer. This is the algorithm that I implemented in my JavaScript example. In fact, let's check back in on that example and see how it's doing. First off, check out how well the complementary filter is holding close to the true down direction, whereas the gyro has wandered off by 30 degrees or so. And if you watch the motion of the complementary filter, it's still moving back and forth in the same direction as the gyro, getting those high frequencies passed through, but it's just being pulled back by the Excel, which is hanging around the true down position. This is the beauty of the complementary filter. All right, so the question might be, why does this implementation that we just walked through appear to work when there doesn't seem to be an obvious low pass or high pass filter? Well, let's work through the math a bit and reduce this block diagram to see what we get. Now I'm zipping through this pretty quickly, but if you pause the video, you can follow along with the algebraic steps. But the important part is that the first half of the resulting function is the summation of the scaled accelerometer and scaled rate measurements and the second half is a discrete low pass filter. So we're scaling the inputs, summing them together, and applying a low pass filter. And that is very similar to what we saw with the continuous domain implementation. So that's pretty cool. Two different ways to implement a complementary filter. 
In one version, we tuned it by adjusting the cutoff frequency, and in the other, we tuned it using the ratio of one signal versus the other. Now, I hope this video helped you understand a bit more about complementary filters and has encouraged you to see if they will work for the control problems that you're working on. It's nice when you can get away with simple filters like this because they're cheap from a computational perspective and they're easy to understand, implement, and tune. If you have any questions or comments on this video, please leave them below and I'll try to answer them if I can. If you're interested in learning more about drone control and simulation, check out my other videos on that topic on the MATLAB channel. The link is in the description below and at the end of this video. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos on this channel, and thanks for watching. And a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you'd like to support me in my efforts on YouTube, you can go through the Patreon link below. For any amount of support, you can download a digital copy of my book in progress on the fundamentals of control theory. And if you just like a copy for free, just email me at controlsystemlectures at gmail.com and I'll send you the latest version. That way we can spread the knowledge and help everyone on their quest to becoming better control system engineers. Thanks everyone.